I'm David Hunt and welcome to The Art Hunter. My guest today has just been appointed president of the Green Room Awards here in Melbourne. Wow, that's an important role, role to have. Uh, he's also an Australian actor, singer, a multi-instrumentalist. Uh, he's a producer as well, not so much these days, but has been in the past. His roles in musical theatre have included Phantom, Evita, Once, Wicked Goes On, uh, and on, and uh, even Cabaret and Cats. Uh, and that's only just naming a few, as I said, it goes on and on. He's also worked in TV, uh, born OS, and uh, you know, like came here as a young child, So, which, which is always an interesting side because you get a different slant, having European um, parents. Uh, and he studied law, but then all of a sudden, while he was at uni, he discovered musical theatre. Da da, the end of his career as a lawyer. Anton, hello and welcome. David, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> That's a pleasure. So your parents try to force you into being, a, you know, doing law? Well, you know, a young Jewish boy, you've got to be a doctor or a lawyer. <laughs> Everything seems to be a waste of time otherwise. <laughs> and what did they say when all of a sudden you, you joined the circus? Um, it was an interesting time. My, my mother's a musician and my father That's right, sadly yeah. passed away. Um, even though he was a computer scientist, he was always a beautiful singer. Yeah. So they loved it when I was performing. It's great, you know, nachas, pride, <laughs> um, when they saw me on stage. But then when I deferred uni the first time, they were a little bit suspicious. And then when I deferred the second time, we had a serious chat. Yeah, um, yeah. But by that stage, I was... 22, 23, I was on tour and um, oh, there was no going back for me. So uh, every self and my mother said, you think you should maybe finish your law degrees? <laughs> it's not so much. I'm like, yeah, this is, what, 30 years ago? Yeah. It was the yeah. last time I stepped foot in a, in a law lecture. So I think those, I think that ship has sailed. Yeah, okay. Look, I'm, we're going to get stuck into your c career as um, a musical theatre, you know, like master of, of the oh, trade bless now. bless you. Uh, but let, let's talk about, for those who don't know, what is the Green Room Awards? Well, the Green Room Awards are the, the peer-led theatrical awards here in Victoria. We're sort of, you know, we're, 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 the, we're it. We're the Tony Awards here in Victoria. Yep. Um, and there are a number of panels across uh, various disciplines that they're all run by um, industry luminaries. So we have, you know... Um, the chairs of the the panel for music theatre, for example, and then a panel uh, a panel of ten people who go and see everything. They're all working actors, writers, designers, um, and most of them have been in the industry. They're veterans, been in the industry for 20, 30 years. Yeah. They see everything. They get together. They have. Um, very rowdy, very engaging discussions about what's what, and nominate. Uh, should create a short list of nominees, and then once a year we award our peers for for their great work. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's 40 years this year. 40 years. And, 40 years. and the sheer fact that, um, and I asked you off, off uh, camera, is that I know that most of the people are volunteers, but they're all, all volunteers, all including volunteers. you. All volunteers. Um, so, you know, like, that's a lot of time and effort, you know, like, uh, as a volunteer. It is. It is. And, um, you know, when I was nominated for this and went through the, uh, you know, the, the, the interview process, um, many old friends of mine have been involved for years, and they said, oh, you've got to expect... You know, the first couple of months leading up to the awards, it's going to be at least two full-time days a week. <laughs> um, it's been full-time. It's yep. been full-time. You know, yep. I'm gigging at the moment. I'm working nights. It's fine. Um, but it's, it's, it is a full-time job. And it's very exhilarating. Yeah. You know? it's a really... Oh, you're finding it oh, enjoyable? Oh, thrilling, thrilling. I mean, there's, you know, a really broad church. I mean, we've got six categories, you know, everything from music theatre, theatre companies, cabaret, creative... Uh, sorry, experimental, there's dance, there's, you know, it's, it's, it's a huge broad church of people. Everyone's got a strong opinion. Everyone thinks their art form is the centre of the world. Of course. So there's, um, you know, there's a lot of negotiation, a lot of diplomacy, which, which I love. Yeah. Uh, and how important is the Green Room Awards to the industry, the performing arts? Look, I think it's, um, it's sort of the, the heart of the industry. Once a year, we as an industry get together and, you know, um, celebrate. We acknowledge, we celebrate. And um, one thing I'm really uh, keen to focus on moving forward is promoting. Um, you know, my background, apart from a performer, <coughs> I ran a production company for 20 years. Yep. Um, and, you know, 
creating that relationship with the audience is primary. You know, we're not doing this in a vacuum. We're not performing theatre for each other. Yep. We're performing it for a broader public. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the executive and I have already started uh, looking at in innovations, ways we can change the way we interact with each other and with the general public to make sure that we're part of the ecosystem yep. that sells the tickets. Yeah, yeah. And and that is so important for, um, you know, like the, the arts is to, you know, like, let people know of what's going on Absolutely. and and we think they do because you know like um we live in a you know like a, a connected world mm, mm. and uh and you know like people are outside of it aren't aware of what what goes on i you know like i do a little bit of other stuff on the on the side not r related to the arts and i'm really surprised on how little people know about the arts yep. and we think that everyone knows we're in an echo chamber i yeah. mean our so social media is is really deceptive because you know you see what you see mm. and you see what you see because that's what the algorithms think you want to see yeah you know out um the difficulty for theater is that our audience has been getting older for decades we need to engage with a young audience which is mm. why i'm in such admiration of um particularly producers like michael castle who are pioneering work for younger people commercial yep. work mm. you now getting young people in the theater mm. i'll tell you an anecdote um years ago um, I saw a musical, it was um, the one by Eddie Perfect about the cricketer. Um, Shane Warne. Shane Warne, the musical. My wife and I went along to opening night and um, it was just about to walk in the theatre and there's an older couple standing there, like they would have been in their early 80s, I reckon. And the guy's looking at his ticket and he looks at his <laughs> wife, he goes, honey, what the bloody hell does stalls mean? <laughs> And, and this is a guy in his 80s who clearly had never, never set been, foot yeah. in a theatre wow. his entire life. Wow. And I thought, there's a thing. Yeah. You know, we've yeah. managed to get a new human being yeah. into a yeah. theatre. Yeah, and an 80-year-old at, at that. Yeah. Uh, but now, um, with all the six, you know, like six yeah. ones of Henry yep. VIII, for instance, you know, like, is, is kicking ass and, you know, like, and coming back to Melbourne and, and you know, being everywhere in Australia mm. now. And now with and Juliet as well, absolutely. Uh, you know, like love them or hate them, uh, what they're doing, as you said, they're they're got young performers in them, and it's appealing to a younger audience, yeah. isn't it? And you know, and we are a big country, we, you know, twenty five million people. It's not we're not America, but you know, there's a market for everything. Yep. There's a market for everything, and mm. there's a market for Greece, and there's a market for and Juliet. There's a market for you know, obscure cabaret and burlesque and all sorts of stuff. And, you know, our job, uh, the Green Room's job as the peak body is to embrace it all mm. and try to give everyone a leg up. Yep, yep. Yeah, well, good on you. And congratulations Thank for you. you taking that plunge because I'm involved in Joy 94.9 and this as well, mm. which I don't make any money out of. I do it as a volunteer. And, you know, like, I, I wouldn't want to do anything else because I'm supporting the arts. Yep. That's what I'm doing. I'm here to support the arts. Now let's talk about you. Oh, stop it! Um, and um, what a career! Congratulations Thank you. on on your career. You've obviously worked very hard to achieve what you, you've achieved, but obviously you're talented enough as well. Um, so, how hard was it? Oh, I think it's going to be bloody easy. The answer for you to step away from the law and <laughs> jump into. Uh, this world of, um, you know, like you'd never know where the, your yeah. next dollar's going to come from. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's that's a great question, a great question. Um, I was lucky, I mean, you know, combination of genetics and, you know, just luck. I had a voice that I could sing, I could sing. I could sing from when I was young, I really enjoyed it, gave me enormous pleasure. Um, I can act well enough, clearly, to, to get hired. Um, I didn't, I never studied acting formally until I was in my 20s, but, you know. Um, and did you go back and study? Or I, I did, I did, I did. I didn't do a degree, but right. um, I, uh, what, ha what happened for me was I was at Monash Uni doing law, got caught up in the Musical Theatre Society there, um, which was a really lively time, and loads of people who are really significant in the industry yeah. nowadays were there with me. Yep. Um, and we're and they were all <laughs> leaving there. All, they're leaving their degrees too, <laughs> and we were having a you know, jolly good time. We are having yeah, a wonderful yeah. time. And, um, and I was lucky enough, I did a production of Man of La Mancha oh, okay. um, in, it was 1991, I guess. Um, 
Uh, and for me, that was a, that was a real bedoying moment. It was a show with substance. Um, you know, people were noticing it was an amateur show, but you know, we were part of the the theatre guild. I think it was called back then. So people were, you know, from the amateur world were coming to see it. And um, I ended up getting cast in uh, the role of George in Sunday in the Park with George with clock uh, which, uh, a, there is a photo here yeah. um, and I was 19 when I, when I when I got cast and what an amazing show that is it's a, about a painting absolutely you know, stunning like just yeah. groundbreaking yep. in that approach as well yeah so that that got me noticed and you know I I thought nothing I thought I'll do it for a bit of fun I was still actually trying to study then. I was still doing my law <laughs> subjects and going to class and doing my homework. Um, and all of a sudden, I had a musical director approach me to, you know, the, the, the late great Brian Stacey wanted me to do a show with him for the Melbourne Festival and then with Victorian Opera. And um, an agent you know, offered me a place who I've been with ever since. I've been with the same agency wow. since I was 19. Wow. Um, and it just started happening for me. And I thought, Okay, well, sure. This is fun. I'll do this, and um, and I did my first. I think my first professional gig was at Playbox um, that same year, ninety one, I think. Um, and then by ninety three, I was doing VSO and Melbourne Festival, and um, I was starting to get really busy. And by ninety ninety four, I got cast in the Secret Garden, which was the tour with An understudying Anthony Warlow. Uh -huh. um, and I've been lucky, touch wood, that I've kept working since. And it hasn't always been easy. Auditions are still yeah. a horrifying process. How hard is it, an audition? You know, like, is it still difficult for Absolutely. you? Absolutely. Absolutely. I've, you know, for years, um, I've never been a great sleeper, but uh, for years when I had an audition, the night before, yeah. I wouldn't sleep. Whoa. I just wouldn't sleep. So I go into the audition, it's, it's <laughs> nothing but adrenaline. Yeah. And mostly it gets you through, but some days... You know, you, uh, you, you what's called blow a sand shoe, which is when your voice just bah! pops out. I, years ago, for the um, original Australian cast of Miss Saigon, I was desperate to do that show, yeah. um, and I was going for the role of John, which is high. You know, he sings Boy Doy and those big B flats, and um, and I sung it a thousand times, and I really like I thought I owned it, and yeah. then I was going for the final callback, and it was you know panel of all the Americans and um, my dear friend John Robertson, the producer, and, and I've bags under my eyes, you know, <laughs> down to my chin. I hadn't slept for two nights because I was so um, keyed up about this audition. I walked in and I, you know, could not get that top note. Just couldn't get it. Just is what it is. You yeah, know, the, the, yeah. and, and it probably it was my body saying, yeah. you don't want to sing this eight times a week for the next two years. Oh, Could have been that. And okay. I'm, you know, lots of people have come out of that show with really wrecked voices. Right. So it's probably, you know, yeah. a blessing. But yeah. um, it's, it's not easy. The auditions are not easy. Every, <sighs> everyone in the industry that I know um, will tell you that that's the worst part mm. of the process. Has there been a role where you think to yourself, you know, like, yeah, I've got it, it's in the bag, mm. you know, like, and then all of a sudden you don't get it? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. There have been loads of those. And, you, you know, you walk out sometimes and you go, yeah, mic drop, I've nailed that, that's mine. Thank you, and you hear nothing. Mm. It just happens. Yeah. It happens. And, and there are so many, you know, variables. They, they put you in the mix. They try to look at you with the other people they're considering for the other roles and... You know, you may be the wrong colour, you may be the wrong height, you, you know, it's about energy, it's all sorts of things yeah. that you've got no control over. Yeah, and, but I, I find it really important to, to talk about it in a situation like this because mm. the general public don't realise what an actor goes through all the, the misses that you get to, mm. to get the hit. Uh, and, of course, there was that wonderful um, musical called The Chorus Line. Have Absolutely. you ever done it? I haven't. Yeah, I no. didn't think you had. Uh, and, um, and, you're like, and when I saw that, and it was years and years ago, I saw it in London, I'm name dropping, uh, and, uh, and I thought to myself, I didn't realise how much of that struggle um, there was mm. uh, for a lot of actors. And, uh, and of course, as years gone, and a lot of actors have said to me, oh, I'm stepping away. I haven't had a role. I'm, I'm getting a bit too old. I'm missing mm. out. And then all of a sudden they'll land something and they're off and running again. It's, um, you can never give up, can I you? I don't think anyone really gives up. So I've never said I'm giving up. I've never said it. Um, but most of my friends have given up dozens of times, <laughs> you know, and just eventually get sucked back in. I mean, it's the sort of thing. And, and my kids, 
they're all wonderfully talented, but all of them too sensible to go into the arts. So, you know, my two, my two girls are both studying to be lawyers. My son's going into science. Um, but I've said to them, and I'll say to anyone, if you have to do it, you have to do it, mm. you know. Um, and I've, once I got into it and understood, you know, that this was a way I could really do something of substance, I felt compelled to do it. But mm. if you can do anything else, do that. Yeah. Life's short, you know, it's, it's a hard road. Yeah. It is a hard road. Now, now, your wife's involved in the business as well and mm. you had a production company together. Uh, you know, like, it, is that a curse or is it a good thing for both of you? Oh, no, no, because no. Because you're in a situation of sometimes neither of you would have an income. Feast or famine. Uh, no, no, it was, it was delightful. My, my wife's a wonderful, wonderful soprano. Um, when I met her, she was a star. I was a chorus boy. She was a star. She was um, playing Cosette in Les Miserables. Oh, wow. When we met. Um, and she was you know, Christine in Phantom, and we did Cats together. She was Griddlebone in Cats, and Hope Harcourt in Anything Goes. You know, um, Teresa is a stunning actor. Um, and working together was actually a genuine joy. You know, um, I did most of the commercial stuff, the selling, the money, um, and she wrote and directed. You know, we, we had this company for tw 20 years, 20 mm. years, and we ended up selling it um, 2016 to Ticketek and worked under that umbrella for three years with them in a very corporate environment, which for us was pretty weird. I mean, it was a, it was a big business by the time we sold it. We had f almost 50 staff. What? Um, Whoa! It was, it was a, yeah, we did shows, we are doing shows all over the world. Whoa! Um, and it was, it was quite a time because we had kids, right? We had, you know, three kids and I was still touring quite regularly um, and we were running the business and uh, we were tired all the time. Wow. Um, it was great to sell it. It was great to then retire. We are now both looking at each other because our kids have, you know, almost all of them have left home. We're looking at each other going, oh. <laughs> What do we do now? Because we're both busy, but yeah. but compared to the sort of level of busy we were in the mid 2000s or even in the early you know 2010, 20, 2010 to 2015, we it was bananas. We yeah. had shows all over the world. We had three tours in the US. We had Gosh. a show on the West End or two shows on the West End, two shows on Broadway. It was it was quite a time. It was quite a time. It feels like a huge blur now. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we're sort of now enjoying our free time, but also wondering how we're going to fill it. Although you've just taken on the Green Room well, that, Awards. Absolutely so, that. So that. But w is there something, you know, like in the background that you think, oh, will we, you know, like, or are you just going to play it by ear and move along the way oh, you're moving? Oh, no, no, we're both, um, we're, we're both working on projects. My wife is, um, she's a fabulous director now. She went back and did a... A master's in theatre writing and okay. she's been writing prolifically. Oh, okay. um, she's got an opera on the hop at the moment which is in the middle of development based on um, The Spare Room by Helen Garner, yeah. a, a wonderful book. Uh, we did a workshop of that in January, did a workshop presentation. We've got a second workshop in September and at the moment trying to get a foundation partner like an Opera Australia or a Victorian Opera to present it. So that's happening. Yeah. Um, uh, can, can we just talk about that? Yeah. Um, you know, like that process as well, mm. it can be a 10 year journey, can't it, for I hope our, uh, but our yes, listeners? It can be. It yeah. can be. Um, you know, we're pretty determined and we're pretty organised and she's got a great writing partner and um, they're you know, we want it to be stage ready by next year. Okay, which so it, only it a couple be. of years you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, well, we, you know, we, we did the original negotiation with Helen Garner's people two years ago. Uh -huh. So we got the rights two years ago. So yeah. by the time it gets to stage, it'll be three years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and sorry, and I interrupted you because you you're were go you were going on ab about um, what what you're doing. She's mm. got that. And She's got that. I'm um, looking at a couple of... Uh, productions to produce. Oh, okay. Uh, which you know, I've got, I've got rights to a couple of things that um, I probably can't talk about just yet. But yeah. you know, significant Broadway. Okay, things. so you can't let go then. I can't let go. I can't let go. I can't let go. I mean, we, look, most of our business, most of the money that we made was made in family shows. You know, uh -huh. so we did Paw Patrol and Dora the Explorer and Sesame Street and all these big sort of arena touring shows all over mm. the world. That was um, terrific. 
our real passion was the musicals. You know, we, we did productions of Passion, City of Angels, uh, The Light and the Piazza. We did the, you know, Sweeney Todd a few years ago with Anthony Wallow and Gina Riley. Mm. You know, and those things, they were really, that was what we were passionate about. Um, but of course, they're the ones hardest to make any money on. Yeah. So in your career, it, you know, like, and you're a musician as well, uh, and uh, uh, that, that's an a extra bonus, I suppose, because mm. being able to read music would have helped you so much along your journey yeah. as well. Uh, but w has there been a couple of shows where you think, oh, I would love to maybe go back and, and be part of that show again? Absolutely. Yeah. Once. Yeah. Um, I did the original Australian production in... 2014, 2015. And you're over your own shoulder there in the oh, production. Oh, there's me with my cello? Yes, yeah, yeah that's right. Um, that was an absolute joy, absolute joy. And um, in fact, I saw it when I was doing Phantom in Sydney last year. I had a night off when it was on at the Darlinghurst. Uh, because the interesting thing <laughs> is the Darlinghurst Theatre um, that's put it on there and of bringing it to Melbourne, mm. Uh, and so, therefore, there's a lot of smaller companies like like you're looking at mm. doing a couple of productions as well. I'm finding that's happening more and more as well. There's the big companies, but then a lot of or a lot of um, young actors starting their own companies. That's, what do you think about that? It's exactly as it should be. I mean, that's that's essentially what we did. You know, when I was 21, um, I thought, hmm, I want a house. I want a family. Um, I want to be able to go out and have a meal if I, if you know, if I choose. So I'm going to have to make my own work just to make sure that you know there's consistency. So that's what I did. Yeah. You know, when I was 21, I started producing kid shows and corporate events, and just you know tried to keep my hand in. But but it could fall over so easily though, couldn't sure. it? Sure. But you can fail doing something you hate. So you may as well try something you love. <laughs> and do you know what? Smart as well because doing a lot of kid stuff. Yeah, you know, like, you know, like parents are looking for something, aren't they? And, and we keep making new audiences. Mm, you know, yeah, the, the, the kid stuff, yeah. the kid stuff, you know, for us was a boon, and it was hard work. It was really hard work, um, but it, you know, once we sort of sort of started down the licensing route, you know, I used to work for the Wiggles. That was um, one of my first. In fact, I think my first license was with the Wiggles because I was dating the girl who was playing Wags the dog <laughs> in the Wiggles movie. I kid you not. And I met, you know, the Field Boys. This yeah. is 1997. I, th I can't remember what I was doing up in Sydney when I was doing a show up there. And I met them uh, through Alex, um, this ex-girlfriend of mine. And um, she said, oh, we're going to go and watch the rushes of the Wiggles movie at Anthony Field's house. Do you want to come? And I'm like, sure, I've come. And you know, we went to his flat and watched this funny old kids movie. I was just got chatting with the guys, and you know, we became friendly. And a few years later, I went, hey, I've got this idea, and pitched them. You know, doing their mini shows, and then I worked for them for eight years, and that got me into Disney, got me into Nickelodeon, yeah. got me into you know all these other licensing. Um, brands. What was it though about them that m they worked internationally, you know, that they were known around the world? What was it? The Wiggles, oh, look, I actually think it's just they were, uh, they came across as everyone's daggy uncle. You know, they were, they were, they weren't, they were youngish guys, but they were grown ups. Yeah. And they were yeah. daggy and they were fun and they were easy going, and the music was really good. You know, the music was always great. It was fun and catchy. You could enjoy it as a parent. Um, it was just genius. I mean, it was confluence of, you know, mm. really good musicians with a good heart and a really good ethic. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I'm I still every surprised success. that, that would, would, they were so big in America. You know, well, I'm not at all. Still I'm You're not, not at all. all. No, because they are. Because you know the background. They really, well, they really appeal to the middle American kind of, you know, the American dream. Um, that, that sort of, you know, tight-knit community. They've, it was very personal. Their, you know, relationship with the audience was very personal. Yeah. And, you know, like, with, with so many productions you've been in, and I'm looking over your shoulder and, and, mm. um, uh, and Wicked is popping up there. Yeah. Uh, you know, like, a big name like Wicked, you know, like, to have on your resume, mm. uh, or doesn't it count the minute you go in to step into that audition room? Uh, no, it does. It does. I mean, I think um, it gets you to the audition. I it suppose, gets you into the it? audition, but but also, you know, at, at, when I'm on the other side of the table and I'm, you know, casting, um, 
it, it matters to me that I can rely on the people we hire to, you know, to turn up, to do the gig consistently, and also to be good company members. Because, um, you know, it's a very unreal sort of environment backstage. It's hard to convey that to people who haven't been there. It's, yeah. a, it's you know, it's like a classroom. In fact, it's, it's like a crash sometimes. Um, <laughs> you know, we're all on top of each other. We live yep. in each other's pockets. Yep. Yep. Um, every, a, any one person's emotional state affects the emotional state of everyone else. It's not like any other workplace. Yeah, uh, and that, that would be very difficult, especially now these days where a lot of people are working from home. Here you are, like literally squashed into small dressing yeah. rooms and running in and out. Oh, of, it's uh, wonderful. Uh, uh, David, which, I love it so much. I know. You know, like this whole thing about working from home, I'd be fit away. I, you know, I just don't get it. You know, like yeah. what you experience as an actor backstage must be just so, and and the stage crew as well. It's, the it is really invigorating. Yeah. Um, every you know every day in the theatre is a joy. People quite often ask me. My kids ask me. My son said to me yesterday. I don't, I don't know how you do it, Dad. Like you know, because I did Wicked something like five hundred times. Whoa. And, you know, um, producers probably four hundred times. Uh, and I said, well, you, you go to the gym, mate. You know, you go to the gym and do basically the same thing. I said, it's like that for me, except it's my social life. It's my exercise. It's, you know, it's meditation. It's, it's, it's so much. And it's um, the ceremony of it, the, the sort of, you know, it's, all, it's almost a sacrament every day. It's wonderful. <laughs> and, and it's, you know, like the rehearsal and then mm. opening night. How exciting is it for an actor to be on stage it's on, on opening night, the nerves, and then at the end of that show, yeah. and there's usually a party or something yeah. afterwards. You know, t tell our audience what, what it's like to be part of an opening night. Opening night's a pain in the ass. Oh! Oh, my God. It's, um, we, we all dread opening night. Like okay. we, 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 we are always thrilled when it's over. Yeah. But it's just another show, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, it's another, you've, you know, usually by the time you get to opening night, you've been rehearsing for four, five, six. In the case of the producers, eight weeks we rehearsed. Whoa. Yeah. Um, and you will have done the show probably 30, 40 times. Um, but for some reason, this night, everyone's <laughs> leaning forward and going, all right. <laughs> Show me what you've got. Yeah, you know, yeah, and yeah. Uh, you got press in, and the producers mm. are all anxious because if it doesn't go well, yeah. they're going to lose their pants. And um, there's this real sort of frisson and anxiety that makes no sense. It's just another example of how how kooky human beings are. You know, we're still doing exactly the same thing we did last night, and that we're going to do tomorrow. But for some reason tonight, something special about it. We just had opening night for Driftwood. Um, and it's, you know, we'd, we'd already previewed and we'd had our tech rehearsals, but we're, we're all standing backstage and hyperventilating, you know, not, just not too dramatically, but yeah. there's, there's this weird energy in the yeah. air. And I thought, oh, yeah. for God's sake, we all need to calm down. It's mm. just another show. Yeah. But afterwards, everyone says, I'm not going to read the reviews and I'm not going to read the reviews. <laughs> Who cares about reviews? We all read the reviews. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course we do. Yeah. And we cry and we laugh and, yeah. you know. What about um, bad reviews? You know, like you, you hear about, especially uh, on Broadway, yeah. if you get bad reviews, um, a lot of shows close within yeah. a week or two. Yeah. Uh, that wouldn't happen as dramatically here, would oh, it? Oh, no, it would. Oh, I mean, you know, our seasons here are shorter. Um, yeah. We don't have, you know, sit-down seasons the way they do in New York, for example, where... Mm. Word of mouth really will, will uh, can sink the ship within days. I mean, a good example is actually Dr. Zhivago that I did, I mean, it was over a decade ago now. Yeah. Um, wonder, beautiful show. I mean, yeah. I thought it was a stunning show. Yeah. They hated it on Broadway. It was closed within a month. Wow. Just dead in the water. And it was because the reviews just, you know, the reviews it, failed to attract an audience. They was kept it the audience justified, away. the reviews, looking well, back I didn't on see, it now. I didn't see the New York production, but, you know, audiences here really liked it. Is, did they t had to tweak it a lot or was it pretty much the same I production? I don't think they would have changed much. It was, you know, I mean, and if, if anything, they would have tweaked it for the better. Right? Yeah, yeah. Because we had, we ran it for, what, nine months? I think we did three cities and, you know, they had plenty of time to iron out the bugs yeah and they had a great cast over there um, but what, what what is it what what does a reviewer see because you know like that whole thing and i use it a lot especially with visual artists artists in the eye of the beholder absolutely uh, and so a reviewer 
Um, yeah, you know, like I often don't take all that. Yes, of course, I see if it gets three or five stars or four and a half, or but. I still want to make up my own mind, but the general public aren't I like wish, that. I wish the general public were like that. Um, and, you know, I can totally understand why, if you're going to be spending $250, which is quite often what the top ticket price is for a big commercial show, you want to make sure you're not going to be dozing off halfway through Act 1. Mm. Um, I guess now things should be a little different because we do have social media and you can get a body of feedback. Um, instead of reading the Age review or the mm. you know, mm. Herald Sun review. Yeah. Um, and, but, and I do think, you know, yes, their job is to review. Absolutely. Like, that's what they're paid to do. They're paid to give the audience their opinion of a show. But, you know, if 120 people's jobs are hanging in the balance, mm. be a human being. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, I, I find it really interesting because I, I will often take a photo out the front with my ticket, mm. uh, letting people know that I'm, I'm at a particular show. Mm. And I usually then mention something about on the way home or the, the next day. And um, uh, probably six months ago or so, I didn't make a comment about it. And about four or five right. people actually said, you didn't like that, That was your you? review. Yeah. Your, your failure to comment was your review. And I was in shock that people picked up on it. But was it because it. you hated it? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. but I didn't want to say. Yeah, yeah. I didn't want to say I didn't like it, so I didn't say anything. But you know, like, but not everyone did, and mm. I know a lot of people that went and loved it. So, uh, but I, yeah, like it was really interesting how I thought to myself. I can't not say something now. You need to tell me what this is. I need closure on it. No, well, like, oh, off, <laughs> off, off camera, camera okay. off camera, I will. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, like look. What you're doing with um, the Green Room Awards is, you know, like, I, I respect you so much for that and being a volunteer doing it. Uh, is it just a 12 months uh, gig or are you going to do a full Do you know longer? what? I actually don't know. I believe, oh, okay. I believe it's a two-year tenure. Oh, two I years. believe it's a two-year right. tenure. So that's plenty. I mean, you know, um, I will love this and I will work at it and I'm going to try to affect change and, you know, spread our wings and yep. communicate better with the general public and, yep. you know, use yep. my marketing experience to build the profile yep. of the organisation. And then I'll move aside and someone else can yeah. take over. And hearing that is so important because the arts need that, you know, like that support in so many levels of getting the word out there. So mm. uh, congratulations on that. And, and the fact is it's on top of everything else you're doing. And the fact that you, you, know, like you might be away for a few months mm. uh, interstate and all that uh, makes it a little bit harder as well for you. So no, congratulations on a brilliant career. Thank like you, mate. You've had a wonderful career. And thank you for heading up uh, the Green Room Awards. It's very important that you're doing that. It's my absolute pleasure and privilege. So thank you for, for watching The Art Hunter. I'm David Hunt and we'll be back again next week. See you then. Bye.